Good evening, lovely listeners, and welcome back to Raven Reads. I'm Raven, and tonight we'll be listening to part two of this epic Let's Not Meet Stories collection. I hope you enjoyed last night's installation. If you missed it, I will put a card at the top right there so you can check it out after this one's over. Thank you to all of you who showed up to the super late premiere last night, to those who watched after, and to everyone who has consistently supported me through the craziness of the last several weeks. I promise there is a ton of content coming your way that I'm sure you're going to love. But without further ado, let's get comfortable, grab some coffee or tea, maybe some popcorn given the length, and get ready to take another journey into the night. This story has a happy ending, I promise. It just takes some time to get there. It's a recount of some unsettling events I went through during my college years, as well as the most amazing example of the bro sixth sense I have ever witnessed. So without further ado, meet Kevin. Kevin was a colleague of mine and was in the same group as me, which meant we had maybe five to six subjects per year together. Kevin was odd. Not that there was something wrong with him physically. He was adorable, a bit nerdy, a bit on the shorter scrawny side with blonde hair, big blue eyes, and like three fluffy hairs on his chin instead of actual facial hair. If I had to compare him to something, I'd say he looked like a cute, soft baby chicken. If baby chickens were mentally inclined to grow into serial killers, but more on that later. At first, I didn't really notice him. There were a lot of people in my class. Everything was new, and I personally did not know anyone, except for a guy named Harper, who I knew from my sports days as we often competed against each other, exchanged some colorful insults on the track, and then went to go get drinks. Harper will be important later on. So, as I've said, I only knew Harper there, and there was only about six other girls in my class, as I've attended classes that held little interest among the female college population, it seems. During that time, I made friends and got really chummy with three more geeky guys. Zachary, whom I eventually dated casually for a short time. Steve, we realized our mothers went to college together too, so, you know, instant friendship. And Rick, with whom I shared many interests. So to count it down, important guys so far, Harper, former sports competition adversary, Zachary, kinda casually went out with for a bit, Steve, chill guy, insta friend, and Rick, nerd and all nerds, but a well of interesting trivia. Awesome guy. These are important. These people would later become my personal army. And then there was Kevin. Damn cute Kevin whom I made the mistake of asking if he had any notes picked up from the first half of a lecture I missed because I overslept. In Kevin speak, hey, got the notes from this morning? Apparently translated into, I have interest in you, oh magnificent Kevin. Nothing would make me happier than knowing I have caught your eye, so please make sure I am never left without your presence again, for I cannot bear it. Yeah. I borrowed his notes, partially copied them, and returned his notebook back to him. What I didn't see was that Kevin then sniffed the notebook when I had my back turned. Zachary noticed it first and snort laughed about it later because my first reaction to it when he told me was to sniff myself to see if I smelled or something. I was young and naive back then, so the sniffing was less what's wrong with him and more what's wrong with me. And that's where it all went downhill. Over the next few weeks, Kevin would always be there, never talking to anyone precisely, just kind of staring at me when we were in class, when we had breaks and went for coffee to the shop outside. Then he started showing up for classes that we didn't attend together, and said he simply arrived too early for his later classes. He never participated, he just sat there in the back. Also, Kevin had a sort of uh, aura about him. Like, you didn't have to look at the door to know when he entered the room. You just felt his eyes on the back of your head and kind of wished for a shower. 
Anyway, I didn't worry too much until one day I went to the women's bathroom during a break. I did my business, went to the front section to wash my hands, and in came Kevin. I was alone. Kevin turned the door behind him, locked it, and then looked at me. Needless to say, I was confused and unsure about what to do, so I just stared at him and said, Do you need something? Hi, he said, and then proceeded with, How are you? Like he hasn't just locked himself in the women's bathroom with me for no fathomable reason. I realized something was very, very wrong and attempted not to panic, managing to keep a nonchalant expression and turn towards the mirror so I could still see him and pretended to fix my makeup. Fine, I said and spoke no more. I could see Kevin fidgeting, playing with the key nervously, and after a long and uncomfortable silence, an eternity really, I heard loud banging from the other side of the door. It was Harper and Steve. Harper yelling something like, Kevin, get your scrawny ass over here and open that door or I swear to God in the next 10 seconds, the door ain't going to be the only thing I'm breaking. I could hear Steve behind him, sounding a bit panicked, telling him to move since he managed to get the spare key. Kevin paled and stepped away, the key he had falling somewhere to the floor. Steve and Harper unlocked the door and Harper jumped on Kevin like a damn primate and knocked him to the floor while Steve and Rick, who was there as well apparently, got inside and all but dragged me out of the bathroom area. None of them wanted to tell me what or why or how any of that happened, but I pushed at the weakest link, who was Rick, when we were alone and found out that a whole hour prior to all of that, Rick overheard Kevin asking one of the on-campus students, the guys who get some extra cash if they help with paperwork and stuff like that, for the ladies' bathroom key and paying him for it. Rick didn't know why the hell Kevin would need that key, but knew that Kevin was a weirdo, so he figured it couldn't be good. Later on, Steve was looking for me and asked Rick if he had seen me, and stuff kind of clicked for Rick. They asked around, and people told them they saw me go to the bathroom area, and I didn't come out yet. More confirmed they saw Kevin going there too, and joked that we must be having a makeout session. Steve immediately connected the dots. Harper overheard him talking to Rick, and they went to break me free from Kevin's affections, while Steve ran to get the extra key from the janitor. Kevin appeared with a lightly black eye in class two days later, and just wishing to forget the whole thing, I pretended he didn't exist. I wish I could tell you that was the end of it. Maybe a week or two went by. I figured he learned his lesson. He's leaving me alone. But then, he got the wind in his sails back for some reason and proceeded with attempting to sit next to me in class. He was so insistent that Zachary got involved, and now the guys made a timetable so two and two would attend class at all times when I was there so each could sit on either side of me. I never asked them to do any of this, they just insisted. After a few failed attempts, Kevin gave up and settled for sitting in the back, glaring at my back and the two guys on duty that day. I wish this was the end of it. Two weeks of that later, Kevin either didn't show up for class or left early. I hoped he found some other interests, and that it was finally over. <laughs> Hell no. I noticed Kevin was now following me to the bus station. It took just one time to see him standing inconspicuously behind the newspaper stand to freak out and call Steve as he lived nearby. Steve picked me up and drove me home. The next morning, Harper called me around 9am and went, Are you in my class at 10am today? I said, Yeah. He goes, pack your shit and wait for me at the end of your street because Kevin's waiting for you at the bus station. Steve just called me. This went on for some five days as the guys extended their bro services to now accompanying me literally at all times before, during, and after class. Just to point out yet again, I am eternally grateful for it. These four dude bros of mine were like the four horsemen of the apocalypse all business and vengeance and it was amazing and they have probably saved me from a lot more problems with cute Kevin. That day, Kevin showed up to class looking somewhat roughed up, but now stared at me with so much hate I could barely cope and finally, after some sound advice from Harper and Rick, 
I decided to bring this shit to college authorities. The pro-dean immediately transferred Kevin to a completely different group so that our classes never overlapped again. I stopped seeing Kevin all the time, and I reached my final year in college. By now, Zachary and Steve had moved away. Harper finished it early and no longer attended classes, so it was only me and Rick now, but it was okay since Kevin was no longer there, and I wish this was the end of it. Rick and I finished college, graduated, and decided to celebrate by visiting a medieval fair in Rick's hometown that summer. We agreed to get some drinks for old time's sake. All was well, we had a great time as we toured the fair a bit, and suddenly Rick, the sweet, polite Rick, goes, son of a bitch, ain't that fucking Kevin? Twas fucking Kevin. Goddamn cute Kevin is there, staring at us, and then turns on his heels and leaves. We saw him a few more times. I started to panic, thinking that he was following me again. So Rick was already dialing a few of his friends to come over, but Kevin suddenly got lost, and I never, ever saw him again. And let's hope this truly is the end of it. So carry on, Kevin, you creepy little chicken. I hope you learn to function in society by now, but either way, let's never meet again. This is something that happened to me a month ago. It's still fresh in my mind, and quite frankly still gives me the chills whenever I go into work to this very day. Some background before I go into this story. I am a female that also happens to be gay. I have a girlfriend, and we both have promise rings. Rings that we show off to anybody that leans toward the flirtier side, or tells us that they want to take us out on a date or something like that. Anyway. I work at a small mom and pop coffee shop in a small community with a few co-workers and a lovely boss that treats us all fairly well. We all get along well and even go out together outside of work to just hang out and have a good time. One co-worker that I'm rather close to and am now even closer to to this day, Matt, is a tall guy, taller than me, and I'm six foot tall, with a slim but muscular build. He's a super nice guy. I think he even had a crush on me at some point until he found out about my girlfriend, and we've been great friends since he started working at the shop with us. We get all sorts of people around the shop, mostly middle class or upper class people that all tend to be super sweet, apart from some picky entitled assholes, and a few strangers that blow in out of from out of town. No big deal. We had a regular come in almost every weekend, and we'll call him James. James is a rather good looking guy, however, a lot older than I am. Let's say that I'm old enough to be in college, but not old enough to drink yet. According to my boss, he came around the shop about once every other week, just to treat himself, but ever since I started working there, he came in every weekend to buy a small coffee or some pastry to snack on. My boss joked, saying that it was because he had a crush on me. I laughed it off. I shouldn't have. Whenever I was at the register, he would get this huge smile on his face and ask about my day, and I would reply with some small talk and hurry to make his order so I could continue doing whatever else I had to do. If I wasn't at the register, he would wait until I was done making other orders so that I could cater to him only. He didn't want anybody but me to help him at the register. I thought that was a little weird and had small red flags going off, but not enough to where I felt threatened or started to get paranoid. Then he started asking me some personal questions. He would ask about where I was going to school, if I lived in the neighborhood that was five minutes away, some of us live about half an hour away from the coffee shop, what my favorite flowers were, etc. At this point, I was uncomfortable with the questions and just gave very vague answers and just outright ignored the prodding about my favorite flowers as well as my school. I then casually brought up that my girlfriend and I were planning on going on a date at some point. I even told him about the ring she gave me and showed it to him so that he could see it wasn't some made up ring. It's actually rather nice and references my favorite video game. And his entire attitude changed. He went from all smiles to a straight face, monotone voice as he snatched his coffee from me and briskly walked out the door. 
I felt triumphant since I figured that would be the end of it, and I volunteered to take out the trash to the large bins outside. The back of the shop is surrounded by other buildings that are also little restaurants and bars that all use the same bins, and it's rare to encounter somebody else when you're going out to quickly dump the trash bags. Sometimes the other workers would be out having a smoke, but that wasn't until later at night, and the coffee shop closes at around 5 in the afternoon. I went outside at around 1 p.m., and I, as I was lugging the large bags, I noticed a man standing in the center of the sidewalk a few feet away. Tons of people walk their dogs around that area, so I didn't think twice about it until I took a double take after throwing the bags in the bin. It was James. He was just staring at me, and with my chronic anxiety and paranoia, something in me told me to stop looking and book it back to the shop. Just as I turned around to start fast walking back, I heard large footsteps running towards me and I instantly picked up speed. Just as I bolted up the steps and opened the door to the shop, turned around and slammed it, I saw that James was right behind me, hand about to stop the door until I shut it. I locked it behind me, hyperventilating due to the panic attack that was now coming on. Matt was working with me that day, and he heard me crying and struggling to breathe in the back, calling my girlfriend for me so that she could calm me down. Now, although I am taller than my girlfriend, she is definitely the toughest out of the two of us and could take out a man twice her size due to all the training she's done since she was a kid. I relayed back to her what had happened and she was livid. However, she couldn't come due to her being at work, so she asked Matt to kind of help me process what happened as we continued to work that day. Over the next few weeks, James would come back and act like nothing happened. And then one week, he just stopped coming altogether. He didn't come in for about three weeks. And I was getting a little nervous because something told me that he was cooking up something really bad. Now I only work on weekends due to the fact that I'm in school and Matt works both weekends and two days during the week. So I asked him to see if James would be coming in during those two days. He obliged and said he would let me know. I didn't get any texts during the week, and a feeling of dread was building up in my chest that I had to work that weekend. Friday, just as I was opening the shop alone, the next person would not be coming in until a half hour after me, in walks James. Technically, we don't open until that second person comes in, but sometimes we let a couple of customers in early since they only want their coffee of the day so they can take off and get to work. Therefore, the stupid front door was unlocked. I was terrified to my very core. I never open alone, and the one time I do, James somehow knew this and took it as his chance. As I saw him walk up, I texted my boss, who was off that day, to look at the cameras and tell Matt, who was working with me and was coming in a half hour later, to hurry up because I did not want to be alone with this man. He started his usual small talk and I obliged, not wanting to possibly set him off. He started going on about how pretty I was, comparing me to models such as Tabria Majors, Summer Green, etc. Flattering, but no thanks. And I just kind of nodded and thanked him. Then he switched his demeanor again. He wasn't straight-faced, nor did he change his tone, but there was something in his eyes that told me that he was calculating what he was going to do next depending on my answer. Now, I'm not a quick thinker when put under pressure, especially when I'm terrified like this, but I put up one hell of a fight. Thank you, military parents. I did mention that James was good looking and older, but he was also way more muscular than I was. I knew that if he was going to grab me, I had to do everything I could to wiggle my chubby self out of his grasp if he jumped over the counter, or if he tried to run around to the back, grab one of the knives we used when making the food and do whatever with it. He started saying how he wanted to take me out, that he would treat me much better than this so-called girlfriend of mine. Yeah, right. And that I should call her and break up with her right now. This took me by surprise, and he knew by the look on my face because this time he slammed his fist against the counter and screamed, 
Call that bitch right now and break up with her or you'll fucking regret it. I was on the verge of tears and I picked up my phone, opening Matt's contact and calling him, praying that he would pick up. Someone or something was on my side that day because he picked up on the first ring. Hello? Uh, hey, baby, there's something I need to tell you. What? I was sweating, trying not to look at James too much, as he seemed pretty satisfied that I had actually listened to him, his arms crossed as I continued holding back my tears. Uh, I know that we've been dating for a while now, but there's a guy that I met at the shop and it made me realize I don't think I can keep this relationship up with you anymore. Matt instantly picked up on how shaky my voice was and the small innuendo I made that I was not alone at the shop and I could hear him running down the stairs in his house and the jingling of his car keys. Don't hang up the phone. I'm coming. That fucking prick is going to get what's coming to him. I'm going to text the boss so they can call the cops. Fuck, just don't hang up. Matt lived in the same neighborhood that I did, which was only a few minutes away. And I prayed to whoever that he was breaking every speed limit out there to back me up. I know you're upset. No, no, it isn't you. It's me. I pause now. And then to act like there was a legit conversation happening, I stayed on the phone even longer. The more suspicious James had started to become, the more nervous I got. He had uncrossed his arms and was slowly making his way toward the small opening that led to the small area where we worked, making my skin crawl as I tried to act like I was going to abruptly end the call. Look, I, I'm sorry, uh, but, but we can't do this anymore. Don't call me again. I hung up and put my phone in my back pocket, raising my hands to show that I wasn't going to do anything. Now, was that so hard? The way James was looking at me, I've only ever encountered that look once, and it was something that I never wanted to see again. I simply shook my head, my eyes now and then quickly looking to the front door to spot Matt's car. For a moment, it was just a heavy silence that was sort of hanging in the air. And then before I knew it, James was throwing the small knickknacks on the counter at me in a fit of rage, screaming that I should never have had a girlfriend in the first place and that it always should have been him. I panicked and grabbed one of the knives in the drawer, putting some distance between he and I as I slowly but sternly shouted at him. I'm gay. I don't want your saggy, limp, microscopic dick or anyone else's. Spit was flying out of my mouth as the adrenaline slowly turned my panic into anger. Before James could even hop the counter, which he looked like he was about ready to do, probably to murder me, the back door slammed open and in came Matt, holding a metal bat, shouting with his deep voice that if James didn't get the fuck out before the cops arrived, he would gladly beat the shit out of him. I instantly ran to Matt and stood behind him, and just as James was about to lunge for the both of us, the red and blue lights outside made him think twice as he bolted towards the back door. Matt tried to block him, but it didn't work, and just as the cops had burst inside, James was already gone. By then, I was a shaking mess. The adrenaline that had been holding me together completely fled as I fell to the floor and started to sob. Matt once again called my girlfriend, who thankfully was off that day and was rushing from her place in the city to come and see me. One of the cops tried their best to calm me down while the other was talking to Matt and asking for a description, telling us that another car was patrolling the area to see if they could catch him. Apparently, he had come to the shop on foot and found his car parked a couple of streets away from the center where all the restaurants were and in some neighborhood that I hadn't been in. My boss came in as soon as they could and gladly handed over the security footage that they had gotten from that morning. I was allowed to go home for the rest of the day, but I chose to go to my girlfriend's place just in case, and they told me that if I ever saw James in my area or my girlfriend's area, not to hesitate to call them again. They alerted the cops in her area as well, since we both hopped back and forth between our places every now and then. My boss posted his face outside the shop as well and inside the shop to let people know that if they saw this man, they were to call the police and that he was not allowed to come inside, especially during the weekends. It just makes me think if Matt hadn't lived so close to me, 
And if I hadn't stalled him for so long, where would he have taken me? Would he have hurt me in the shop or dragged me back to his car and taken me somewhere else? I truly believe that this man had something very sinister planned for me. So James, you fucking creep that can't take no for an answer, let's not meet again. My fiance and I threw a dinner party once to celebrate his mom completing chemo. I hired a caterer. We were expecting 25 friends and family, so it was more than the kitchenette of our single-story ranch home could handle. We'd also only just moved in, so we didn't have a lot of cooking staples. The caterer said he'd bring everything 75% done, but that he needed to finish off some of the dishes in our kitchen. I told him that would be fine, as long as he was finished by 5 p.m., because the kitchen is centrally located, and we'd prefer everyone be finished before the guests arrive due to the intimate nature of the occasion. And he said that would be fine. He arrives as scheduled at noon, and we gave him until 5 p.m., and the guests weren't even arriving until 6, so it's plenty of time. He smelled like actual dog shit, but his accent sounded European, so I thought maybe he just didn't believe in deodorant or something. It was more than the smell of sweat, though. It smelled like a sun-baked diaper, and that made me uneasy because he was going to be preparing food for sick prior and young kids. I just made sure that he washed his hands and then left him to his own devices, worrying that I was being judgmental and presumptuous. Throughout the entire process, he keeps pulling me aside to ask me questions and have me taste things. I was super busy because my husband had to work during the day and pick up the surprise guest right after, so setting up the deck, decorating, putting together the slideshow equipment, coordinating the surprise guest, we flew in her sister and I had to make sure she got an Uber at the airport and her hotel had worked out, just a million details that I was responsible for. So every 10 minutes asking things like, do you prefer this with paprika or without? Or what do you think this tastes like was getting old. When he was still there at 545 after two gentle reminders, I flat out told him I needed him completely out by six no matter what. He apologized and said that there had been a delay because our oven wouldn't stay up to temperature. Now I've never had a problem with our oven, but I figured he's the professional, maybe it was a subtle problem. A little before six rolls around, a few of our friends start trickling in. I decide to tell him that whatever he's done is done and whatever isn't should just be put, put in the fridge, but he's nowhere to be found. I go out on the deck to ask my friends if they'd seen him, and he's out there, alcoholic beverage in hand, out of his chef whites, and now in a t-shirt and jeans, mingling with my friends. I walked out just in time for him to introduce himself to my cousin-in-law as a good friend of mine. Nope, too weird for me. I met him in person for the first time barely six hours ago. I told him that he needed to leave now. So he goes inside and gets his bag and makes a beeline for my bedroom. I'm taken aback. I say, excuse me, where are you going? And he says, to change. So first of all, we have a guest bathroom that is clearly visible. And second, why can't he wear a t-shirt and jeans home? I tell him that I'm not comfortable with him going in my room. But he insists that it'll only be a second and goes in and shuts and locks the door. I couldn't even get a word out before he went in and I felt completely helpless. I was going outside to ask one of my friends to help me usher him out, but at that point my fiance got there with my aunt-in-law. I had to explain the situation to him, nearly in tears at that point, and he was like, what? He went into the bedroom? Why? So he went in and pounded on the door and the caterer came out still in a t-shirt and jeans and my fiance said you shouldn't be in there you need to leave and the caterer looked at him and said excuse me but this is not your house it is not up to you to decide and my six foot four 260 pound fiance tells him yes actually it is his house 
At that point, he puts a hand on his back and guides him to the door. The caterer says, I thought Frantic Sletter lived here. And he says, yes, my fiance lives here with me. And at that point, the caterer goes nuts. He turned around and screamed at me. You lied to me, you bitch. Now I have no clue what he's talking about. He starts yelling about how I led him on and kept calling me a bitch over and over. I don't know who he thought the man in the pictures with me around the house was. So my fiance says, uh, no, you won't talk that way in my house. Find the door. And the caterer goes in the kitchen and starts throwing the trays of food out of the refrigerator and onto the floor. At that point, my fiance realized that two of his brothers, who both currently were offensive linemen in the college level, had come in and were on the deck. He signaled to them and said, this guy is harassing Frantic Sledder, my username, if you didn't catch on. Since they're a family of all boys and my fiance is the first to get married, they don't get to flex their protective muscles too often, so they jumped at the chance to toss this guy out. The party then went on as planned, but I insisted that we order pizza and throw out all the food he made. My fiance and friends kept saying, isn't that a bit much? But I was insistent. We went out late drinking with his brothers and got home around 3.30 a.m. and passed out in our room. I wish that was the end of the story. At around 5 o'clock a.m., I was woken to the sound of the door opening. I figured either we forgot to lock the door in our drunken stupor and it blew open, or one of his family forgot their keys or something in the house and didn't want to wake us. His parents and his local brother both have keys. But his parents never, ever, ever let themselves in when they know we're home. And his brother had had even more than we did and was definitely not awake and driving at 5 a.m. It wasn't nearly windy enough for the door to have blown open. It had been tranquil all night. So I wake my fiance up and whisper, someone just came in the house. And he said the same thing I had been thinking. Probably my brother left his wallet or something. I figure I'm being paranoid and I try to put it to rest when suddenly I hear a loud crash. With that, my fiance was up and on his feet in one fell movement. He told me to lock myself in the closet and call 911 while he went and looked around. As I was pulling out my phone, we hear in that distinct accent, frantic letter, hello? And I realize it's just the insane caterer. Now, I'm not worried about this caterer physically overpowering my fiance or me for that matter. So I charge right out there. The caterer is shirtless and clearly on something. He's taking the pictures that are of just me off the wall and holding several in his arms already. He lunges towards me when he sees me. My fiance gets between me and him and I call 911. Fiance tells him cops have been called and it is in his best interest to get off the property. The caterer says, no, I have to make sure she is okay. I said, what? Why wouldn't I be okay? And my fiance rightfully says not to engage with him and feed into it. My fiance stays between me and him while I climb out a window. He watches as the caterer throws photos of us onto the floor. And the fiance didn't want to subdue or touch him in any way so that the caterer couldn't make any assault claims if we could avoid it. He's begun to destroy our kitchen at this point, and when the cops came in, he had a butcher knife in his hand. My fiancé considered going for the gun safe when he first got his knife, since we live in a stand-your-ground state, but he decided the situation was hectic enough without introducing a firearm. The caterer didn't obey the police orders to stop or to drop his weapon, and he just says, I'm not leaving without her, over and over, so they tase him. It's lucky for him he only got tased, and he didn't antagonize my husband into squashing him. As he's let out in cuffs, he's shouting how he and I are in love, and it figures that I would choose a macho thug over a sweet, sensitive artist like him, and that all women are whores, etc., etc. He continues on this tirade the entire time the police are reading him his rights. The police ask us to do an inventory of the house and see if anything's missing or damaged besides what we witnessed him do. 
We go around and there's nothing, but that's when I remember that he was in our room yesterday and I go through the entire room. All of my panties from the dirty laundry hamper were gone. We were so freaked out in the aftermath that we replaced all of our kitchenware, toothbrushes, sent our sheets to be professionally cleaned, and had a cleaning crew do a deep clean on the whole house. We were not taking any chances. I'm so glad we decided not to serve the food to our guests and my fiance's medically fragile mother. He sent me a letter from prison that thankfully my husband intercepted because I was still recovering from the whole thing. We gave it to the police who helped us get a no contact order. He was sentenced to three years in prison five years ago, so he's out by now, but thankfully we haven't met since and I hope that we never do again. Ever since I was 14 years old, I've been scared of lightning. It started when I was out on a soccer field during a thunderstorm and lightning struck the fence, just over 100 feet away from me. The sound was deafening and I can still remember the awful sensation of the sound vibrating through my whole body. But this wouldn't be my only incident involving a lightning strike that I came too close to. But the next time it wouldn't only scare me, It would also be my salvation. When I turned 20, I moved out of my parents' house, who still lived in the capital of my country, to a small community in the south, and I have no intention on moving back. Sure, a girl that grew up in this city is used to the endless variation of restaurants, bars, stores that never close, and a city that never sleeps, but I like it here. Despite the low population of the community and something of a sleepy town stamp on it, it's a charming city with colorful wooden houses, the seaside campus, and the smell of butter from the old butter factory as an eternal reminder of where you are. I can practically go out whenever I want, wherever I want, and meet a total of 10 people, the neighborhood cats, and if I'm lucky, a cute but very lost hedgehog. There's one more reason why I appreciate living in a small town. It is how incredibly safe I feel here. In the city, you can barely be outside alone as a woman after 10 p.m. without feeling such discomfort that you feel compelled to check behind you once or twice every minute. All such discomfort, however, doesn't only happen after said time or during the darkest hours of the day. It can happen at any time. But that's something you learn. It was something I had to learn. I was 17, and it was the summer holidays. I was spending most of it at my then-boyfriend's house, and he lived with his family about 20 minutes outside the city. I lived with my parents at the time in the city center, just along the green subway line, so if I wanted to get back home, I had to take the commuter train to the central station, walk across it and switch to the green subway line, and ride a few minutes on there to get to my station. I was then in one of my rebellious periods, and a month before I had bleached my hair. I loved it at first, but after a while my roots started to show and I realized my mistake. My angel of a mother had grown tired of me fussing over it and booked me at a hairdresser so that I could go back to my natural deep brown color. The day for my appointment at the hairdresser came, and I was, as usual, at my boyfriend's. But I needed something from my parents' apartment first, so... I put on my headphones and jumped on the commuter train. I switched as usual to the green line and sat near one of the doors that I knew would line up perfectly to where I would get off. I like to crowd watch when I travel, not to stare people out or anything like that, but just to look at people and think about where they're going, what they do for work, maybe make up a story about them. It's kind of a game that I often find myself playing on the subway or commuter train. I played that game that day. I looked around at people, and when there was one station left until my stop, my eyes stuck to a man who was sitting a few feet in front of me. He was tall, perhaps in his mid-thirties. His hair was dark and scruffy, and he was wearing dark clothes and big boots. He sat with his elbows leaning against his knees, crouching slightly down toward the subway floor. Today I don't remember what my analysis or fictional story was of him but I know that I saw him. 
The woman in the speakers shouted out my destination and I stood up and went to the doors and stepped off. When I got out of the doors of the station, I saw that it had started to rain, so I pulled my big hood over the headphones that I had in and started to quickly walk up to the apartment, which was only a few hundred feet from the station. The apartment is an old building with a large wooden door facing the street. The door has a glass pane that runs along the entire door, and when you enter the staircase, it's entirely in marble with an old wooden elevator with an iron lattice door so that you have to close it manually. When I got to the door, I put in the entry code and pushed it. When the door was swung aside, something was reflected in the glass. I turned around and saw the man from the subway standing right behind me. At first I was a little shocked that he was so close to me, but I assumed that maybe he was one of my neighbors or a neighbor's friend. I also assumed that he stood that close to me because it was raining and didn't want to get wet, so I just said hello and pressed up on the door a second time with my hip while I took off my headphones. He didn't answer. I went to lift and press the button, but I heard that it didn't start, so I assumed that a neighbor had opened the lattice door to sort of park the elevator at their floor while they locked their door. I turned around and saw the man standing behind me, shaking. It was not a typical type of shaking that's common if you have a fever or a cold, but more like a spastic twitching. He stood there, jerking, with his head and his back curved as he had on the subway, but this time his eyes were not on the floor, they were on me. He opened his mouth to speak, but only incoherent sounds came out while he stood there, shaking and jerking around, becoming more frantic. "'What's your name?' he said at last. I remembered my parents' words of wisdom to never tell your name to a stranger, especially one whom feels threatening. I wanted to tell him to go, but I felt like I was frozen and that provoking him might make the situation worse. I replied with a fake name. He then said, do you live here? I lied and answered that I didn't, I was just here to see a friend. I remember thinking that I was smart. Now he didn't know my name or where I lived, I thought, but... It was now that he started to move closer to me. I started backing away. He must have seen the fear in my eyes, but he continued, scuffling toward me. I heard the elevator engine start ticking, and that it was on its way down. He told me that he'd been following me since on the train, and that he saw me there and that he just had to follow me. It was now that he lifted his head from his previous position, showing how tall he really was and the shaking stopped. He spoke again. You're the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. If I thought I was frozen before, that was an understatement. I was now pressed against the elevator door, and he was so close that I could feel him, smell him almost. Some may think that these words still have to be somewhat flattering, but the way he said it, it sounded like a death sentence. It sounded like something that was really bad for me. It was about when I heard the elevator stop on the first floor and someone walk down the stairs to the courtyard that I took my first breath in what felt like an hour. The door is located on a small platform between the ground floor and the first floor of stairs. You also know how you can recognize and distinguish your parents' steps from others. I did with this, with these steps that came down the stairs and I knew they were my father's I quickly thought I could scream for him, but then I realized that the man would know that I had lied, and that he might get angry and do something to my relatively old father. That was when my father opened the door to the courtyard, and the lightning struck the yard. The sound waves of the cracking lightning pressed itself through the open door and made the whole marble stairwell scream. I screamed. The man screamed. I went to my usual position regarding thunder and lightning, fetal and on the floor. He, on the other hand, jumped backwards and started running out while he shouted that we will be seeing each other again soon. I barely realized what had happened. I went crying up in the elevator and into the apartment where I told everything to my mother and also father when he had come up from the courtyard. 
We reported the incident to the police and I went and dyed my hair, which made me feel a little safer as my appearance had changed quite drastically. I was still a little scared after the incident, but also confused. I just kept thinking about what he was saying when he ran out. We will be seeing each other again soon. I knew at least that I absolutely did not want to see him ever again. However, I didn't get what I wanted. About a month passed and I had practically forgotten about the situation. I was on my way to Central Station to meet up with my boyfriend who was on the commuter train on his way to see me. I stood and waited for him in the hallway between the commuter trains and the subway. In that particular hallway, a lot of people are walking, either to the trains or from the trains. Very few people are just standing still. As I said, I stood there, looked down the hallway from time to time to see if my boyfriend had come yet, when I see someone else standing still. There was someone standing on the other side of the crowd, and although everyone goes in different directions and creates kind of a blurred effect on him, I see exactly who it is. I freeze just like before. He stares at me, not like our first meeting, but like he's trying to figure out if I am who he thinks I am behind the dark hair. Then my boyfriend comes from the crowd and hugs me, and I have to look away from the man for a few seconds and hug him back. I leaned my head against his shoulder and looked over it to see if the man was still there, but he was gone. I haven't seen him since, but I keep wondering if he has seen me, and if so, how many times. Regardless, I hope we never meet again. I live with my girlfriend as expats in a pretty foreigner-friendly Asian country. Most of the time we get by just fine, despite only knowing a little bit of the local language, because most people we interact with on a daily basis speak fluent English. We started out in a tiny apartment, which we quickly outgrew, and we found a gorgeous condo with nice amenities and decided to move in. This condo is owned and managed by a local owner rather than by an association or a company. The building is a little bit older, which means that instead of keycard access to our door, it came with a traditional key lock and sliding bar latch, which is nice because it's more durable than a chain. Of note, our original building also had keycard access to our floor, meaning that we could only ever access our own floor. Even in the emergency exit stairwells, we couldn't get to other floors that weren't our own without the keycard associated with that floor. This new place did not have this measure, and I routinely enjoyed a walk up the 15 flights of stairs to the room as a bit of a warm-up before going swimming. The quaint feeling of all this changed about two months after we moved in. We were both starting new jobs and dragged our feet on some of the final touches of moving into a new place, and that's the last time we ever do that. My girlfriend nudged me awake at about 3 in the morning. I wake up extra groggy and unsure of my surroundings, but I snap to full attention when she whispered with wide eyes, someone's trying to open the door. Now the condo is 100 square meters and the main door and the bedroom are at opposite ends. The bedroom itself has a rather sturdy door that was closed and the aircon runs at night. So this had to have been some commotion for her to wake up. I sprang out of bed and made it to the door in seconds. I also sleep buck naked, so I awkwardly tried to put on a pair of shorts while I peered through the peephole. There was some guy outside our door, studying very intently at our lock. He was about my height, though probably 15 kilo heavier, and he was not a foreigner like us. Wrong room, I had to yell because the door is pretty thick. There was a pause and then a thud. Then a smaller talk, talk, talk as he was knocking on the door. From experience, I know that it's hard to hear through the damn door and if English was not his first language, then understanding me through the door was going to be a real challenge anyway. Looking through the peephole as he kept steadily knocking, I noticed that he was swaying back and forth slightly. So I figured maybe he had a couple too many drinks and just had the wrong room. I turned to my girlfriend and told her so, and that I was going to open just the key lock but not the bar latch, 
and tell him that he had the wrong room. She didn't love the idea, but what was a good alternative? I took a deep breath and undid the key lock. My hand shook a little as I turned the handle, and one hand braced against the door, while the other opened it just slightly. He must have been leaning close because I saw his face right at the opening, and I could smell beer on his breath. Hey, you've got the wrong was all I got out before he pushed against the door as hard as he could. The bar latch held, but it was not enough. My girlfriend threw herself against the door, and with our combined force, we shut it. No, I yelled. Go away. Wrong room. Then he muttered something that sent chills through me. The door muddled the noise, having just woken up playing tricks on my ears and the language barrier filled in the gaps, but I could swear that I heard him laugh a little and say, stupid boy. I froze. My girlfriend turned the key lock as he slammed his body into the door once, twice, three times. I lost count. Every time I pressed against it harder, but I could still swear the four screws that held the bar latch in place wiggled slightly. Expats make jokes here about some of the shoddy construction, but this was the first time I really considered it a major concern. The thuds returned, and looking through the peephole, I could see that he was punching the door. His stoic face looked patient and annoyed as he swung his arm back over and over. Each time it hit my girlfriend and I could feel the vibration through our entire bodies. This felt like a nightmare, like I was still sleeping. Was this even real? Was this guy actually trying to get into our condo? Was I being generous thinking he just had the wrong room? He saw me, a white guy, inside and he should have caught a glimpse of our kitchen area. Even drunk he should have known that this wasn't his condo, right? But what if he wasn't lost? What if he knew exactly what he was doing? What if he came in off the street with someone else and bided his time and waited and tested doors at 3 a.m. until someone was stupid enough to crack one open? Stupid boy. His words echoed in my brain. After what felt like an eternity, the pounding stopped, and I looked through the peephole. He wasn't there anymore. I listened closely, and I could hear the long ding of the elevator down the hall. He might be leaving. My girlfriend had both our phones, texting the condo owner on hers and shoving mine toward me. She was calling the owner, but at 3 a.m. there was no answer. Frantic texts of someone's trying to break in spammed the other end where no one was picking up. She messaged friends of ours who live in the next building, but we both knew it'd be hours before anyone responded. This is where I kicked myself. We knew the emergency number, but neither of us had taken the time to collect the local police or the building security's information. This is a mistake that I will never make again, no matter if I'm starting a new job or whatever the excuse. Having a list of fast response numbers is as big a priority as getting the keys to the place. We calmed down a bit and agreed that we were going to be up the rest of the night, but that we'd settle up with the condo owner in the morning and report to the building management. There were security cameras in the hallway, so they should be able to follow up. And that's when I heard the elevator ding again. I was shaking as I returned to the peephole and watched as the chunky man returned. He was hanging up a mobile phone and retrieving something from his pocket. It looked like either a knife or a multi-tool. And that's when I said, he's back. And I grabbed the biggest kitchen knife within reach and turned to brace the door. My girlfriend was almost in a full-blown panic as she grabbed the cast iron skillet. That's when I realized for the first time that there was a chance that someone was going to die that night. The door handle was wiggling as he started to poke at the lock with whatever he had in his pocket. If he opened one lock, the only thing between him and us would be four tiny screws on the bar latch. And if he got into this condo, we were going to defend ourselves as best we could. And that's where I realized we were foreigners and dealing with manslaughter charges in a foreign court system would be an absolute nightmare. Or if we severely injured him and he was able to communicate his story to the police his way while we struggled with an interpreter, we would be at a severe disadvantage. 
And of course, this was all assuming that we would be the ones to overpower and subdue him. I had no idea who he was on the phone with. What if this guy had friends scouting other rooms in the building? Or what if he was a guest of someone upstairs? Maybe he just told his poker buddies to come down and rough up the helpless foreigners. I measured up my girlfriend with a skillet and myself with a kitchen knife and found myself honestly wondering how many drunk stocky men we could take. All this was running through my head as I called the equivalent of 911 and shouted English into the phone until someone spoke English. My brain wouldn't quiet down long enough for me to be polite. I finally got an operator that spoke English and I explained someone was trying to break into our condo, that he had left and returned and I gave him the address. He sent a car and I asked for an ETA and he couldn't give me one. Great. Thanks for that. It felt like forever, holding the key latch shut with one hand, knife on the counter nearby, and phone in the other, waiting for the emergency team to call back, all while listening to his muttering and pounding on the door inches from my head, looking at the woman I love next to me, terrified, also wondering what was going to happen to us in the next few minutes. He wandered off again, but my spidey sense was in full alert mode. It wasn't until half an hour later when several people wearing police uniforms and building management jumpsuits knocked on the door that I calmed down even a little. Still, I wasn't sure what to expect. One of the group spoke English while the rest stood back. I explained everything in detail and pointed at the camera in our hallway, saying I wanted whoever it was found. One of the cops pointed at the nearby knife and raised an eyebrow, and I just confidently said, yeah. I would have if I needed to. He seemed to smile a bit. After assurances and apologies and promises of following up, we received what we should have collected weeks ago. Direct phone numbers to our building security room where cameras are monitored, as well as the local police station and the personal mobile number of our building security director. The sun was coming up and our condo owner called my girlfriend to comprehend what was going on. She promised us that she'd send locksmiths there that day to install another deadbolt as well as a second bar lock if it helped us feel safer. The follow-up of everything was that the guy was indeed someone who got drunk and mistook the room and was on the wrong floor. That wouldn't have been an issue if we had had keycard access per floor, right? He was apparently known in the building for this. Would have been nice to let us know, huh? His wife had to come and collect him more than once, and he would be fined for the cost of installing extra locks. So while this is a bit comforting to know that he's a random drunk instead of a murderer, I still explain to the building management that I have no desire for an apology from him. I don't care if he feels bad or not. Police reports here can be messy, and locals can hold severe grudges that I just did not want to deal with. I will only keep from making a full police report if I literally never see or hear from him again. I was told that stupid boy was a mix of foreign language and my ears playing tricks on me, but I'll never be 100% sure of that. Either way, I hope I never meet that guy again. A week or so before my 10th birthday, I walked to the corner store with a $5 bill and picked up a jar of ragu for my mom. On my way home, a man that I'd never seen before fell in step with me and began talking. Hi, he said cheerfully. My name is Dr. Ramsey. I'm a pediatrician. Do you know what a pediatrician is? I walked along silently, not replying and fervently hoping he would take that as a sign that he should leave me alone. Subtleties were not his strong suit though because he kept right on chattering. Are your parents looking for a pediatrician for you? Of course, you're almost a big girl now. You'll be needing another kind of doctor soon, won't you? That's okay though. They can still bring you to me until then. What's your name? You have beautiful hair. I was just on my way to get some suckers for the candy jar in my office. Do you like suckers? Thankfully, we were nearing my house, so I ran forward up the back steps and into the kitchen. I didn't know it then, but that would be the beginning of a very long and very scary ordeal. It didn't take long after that for Dr. Ramsey to begin showing up. At first, it seemed benign enough, at least to my kid brain. 
He would drive by nearly every day, smiling and waving. I told my mom, who said maybe it was just on his way home from work. But then the phone calls began. My dad called me into the living room and sat me down. He asked me about the day that Dr. Ramsey followed me home, and if I talked to him. He said that I wasn't in trouble, but that I needed to tell him the truth. I told him no, and he asked if I was sure, could I be forgetting something? I told him no again, and then he frowned and said, then how does he know your name? I didn't know. It turned out that that wasn't all Dr. Ramsey knew. He knew my sister's name as well. Pretty soon, neither my sister or I were allowed to answer the phone. He called several times a day. At first, neither of us knew what he was saying. Then one night, one of my brothers told us that he was telling my parents that he was going to hurt me, and after that, my sister. Things got complicated after that. My dad had called the police, but as this was before there were any stalking laws, there was not a lot they could do. They told my parents to call back if he quote unquote tried anything. My dad then called a friend of his from back in the day who happened to be a cop. For the next month, my dad's friend escorted me to and from school. Suddenly, life as I knew it came to a screeching halt. I couldn't walk to school alone. I couldn't play outside. I couldn't walk to Super America, which is sort of like a 7-Eleven. When access to me was completely denied, things escalated. It was around this time that he began threatening my sister as well. Then one afternoon, my sister, two of my brothers, my mom, and I were in the kitchen. One of my brothers saw a glimpse of someone in the garage. They'd seen him too. Dr. Ramsey came bolting out of the garage, my brothers chasing after him. They ran all the way to a nearby park where he lost them in the trees. My parents called the police again, but nothing came of it. The only information they had was a description and a name that was almost certainly fake. A couple of weeks later, we woke to find our dog hanging from the side porch. She was a gorgeous saddleback German Shepherd, born the same day I was. We were all devastated. The cops said that there was no evidence it was him and ruled it accidental, but not a single one of us believed that. His phone calls became more informative in the meantime. He would talk about who was home and who wasn't. If my brother would say that my dad was home, he would tell him who was really in the house. He also would talk about the house itself, about the window in the kitchen that he could easily open with a knife from outside even when it was locked, and about the French doors that connected the living room to the side porch and how the lock could be finangled from the outside if you jiggled it just right. That night, my dad put in some carpenter nails at the bottom of the French doors until he could get a new lock ordered. My parents had to go to a company event for my dad's work. My older brothers were at Saints West roller skating rink, and my sister was on the phone with her best friend. My little brother was on the floor asleep. I was watching Devo and the Midnight Special with Wolfman Jack. It was late. Suddenly, the top of the French door swung inward, and the few milliseconds we had before the nails at the bottom caused them to snap back, I could see his silhouette. My sister whipped the phone at the television and we ran upstairs. About halfway up, we realized our little brother was still asleep on the living room floor. As quietly as we could, we slipped back down the stairs to get him, and we all went into our bedroom and didn't turn on the light. This way, we could see outside. We watched out the window for a while, and when we didn't find him, we crept down the hall to our brother's room to look. We looked down, and we could see someone standing at the back door. He knocked loudly. What do you want? My sister asked out the window. He stepped back and said, Is this the Mercy residence? I have a pizza for delivery. Can you come to the door? She scoffed at him, declaring that she wasn't stupid, that she could see he didn't have a pizza, and that she was calling the cops. He left. A short while later, my brothers returned home. We told them what happened, and they walked around the yard, watching for him. They came back in, and things settled down. By now, we'd pretty much given up calling the cops, because it never helped anyway. 
So we just went back in. Each of us, except my youngest brother, who was still asleep, was carrying a knife from the kitchen, just in case. Eventually, one of my brothers went into the kitchen to get a bowl of cereal as a snack. You know that sensation you get when you can just feel someone watching you? Yeah, he had that in spades. He kept looking around the kitchen, through the doorway, into the dining room, at the windows. He didn't see anything, but he could still feel the eyes on him. So he went closer to the door to try to see better. The kitchen lights were reflecting on the windows of the door. It had three rows of windows. So he still couldn't see. He stepped closer, and then closer again, until he was right up to the door then cupped his hands on either side of his head so he could see. There on the other side of the window pane was Dr. Ramsey, smiling back at him. He turned to yell for my older brothers, and when he looked back again, he was gone. They went out again to look for him, but didn't find him anywhere. The next night, we were at the table playing Crazy Eights, and my brother was restless. My sister asked him what was wrong, and he said he always felt like at any minute there would be a banging on a door or a window. Literally, almost immediately after he finished his sentence, boom, 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 on the window right behind him. In the chaos, the two eldest ran out, but he was already gone. A couple of weeks later, I was at school, and we were outside on the playground during recess. I was swinging upside down when I saw that now familiar blue Ford Galaxy cruising by, moving slowly. There he was, smiling and waving. He called my name and I ran to the teacher and told her. The school had been informed all about him and she took me inside right away and called my mom. That same day, my mom had gotten a call from the school office asking her to verify that my dad was picking me up as he'd called to say he was on his way. He wasn't. Not long after that, I woke up one night, thirsty. I went down to the kitchen for a drink, and there, sitting alone in the dark, was my dad. On the table was a gun. He was tired of the police waiting until Dr. Ramsey tried something. He was tired of his children being terrorized. He was tired of being afraid every time he left for work that something would happen to us while he was gone. I sat with him for a time, watching, before he sent me back to bed. These events, and many more, took place over a period of 18 months. Then, as suddenly as it began, it was over. He had vanished from our lives. The phone calls, the drive-by with the creepy waves, everything. For a long time, during and after the Dr. Ramsey days, I would have a recurring nightmare in which I would wake up to find him standing over me as I slept. It took a long time before I felt like a kid again. I found out years later that when he was calling, Dr. Ramsey would tell my parents that he was going to rape and kill me and later my sister and that there was nothing they could do about it. I don't know what happened to him when he disappeared. I don't know if he was in a car wreck, got locked in prison, fell into a coma. But sometimes I wonder if the wait ended for my dad when he was sitting in the darkened kitchen one night. I don't know, and I am not sure I want to. All I do know is that I hope I never see Dr. Ramsey again. This happened just about an hour or so ago. Me, my sister, my godmom, and my god aunt, who we'll call Jenny, went to the movies to see the new movie Shazam. About 30 minutes into the movie, a guy that none of us knew stood next to Jenny. He leaned over and said hi to her and then practically fell on top of her. He then went around the back of our seats. He sat only one seat down from me. He then stared at my family and the people on the other side of him for a few minutes, and then he began digging through the seats like he was looking for something. This went on for about 10 minutes before he pulled something black out of the seat. He then looked at us, stood up, stumbled out of the theater and left. My godmother and I think that he might have been drunk. If he had been there earlier and was looking for something he left behind, 
he wouldn't have checked every empty seat. The fact that he had gotten stupidly close to my aunt and practically fell on top of her and then proceeded to stare at us is creepy and weird, but we're just glad that nothing worse happened. So, creepy movie theater guy, let's not meet. I live in a normal suburban family. My two parents, my younger sister, and my cousin, who has lived with us since he and I were six. We've never been close because of his personal problems related to some mental health issues. Anyway, he was a part of our family, even if things were sometimes difficult for us and for him. He was my sibling, through and through. Cut to our teenage years, and my sister plus parents are going a few hours away for a dance competition that my little sister is in. My parents let us stay home since I have a 6am shift the next day at work after they come home, and the weather's too nasty to lug all five of us through. My parents leave at about 5.30 in the morning of the competition. I move to the master bedroom to keep an eye on the puppy, and my cousin moves from his room to the couch. All goes well that day. He makes cookies for his co-workers, we watch TV and eat a lot of snacks. I drive him to a sandwich shop and we grab a sandwich and then we went home to eat it. All normal things. Around 9.30 p.m. my parents text me that they're heading home, so I decide to shower and head to bed. After all, I have to be up really early. So I shower and I bring my phone into the bathroom since I was texting some Discord friends and I always clean my phone after I shower. I know, it's weird. My family teases me about this incessantly, but it's my ritual, so whatever. I'm washing my hair when I feel something brush against my arm. I whip around, startled, and it's my cousin, completely naked and in a state of arousal. I immediately scream for him to get out, but he just puts his hands on my shoulders and tells me to calm down and that he doesn't know how else to tell me, but he loves me. I scream for about 30 full seconds before I finally calm down and coax him out of the shower. He leaves and I take a few minutes to process whether or not what I just saw was real. I dialed my parents who instructed me to call a neighbor to come and get me as they're still two hours out of town due to the road conditions. I called the neighbor that I often babysit for and told her about the situation and she rushed right over. We decided to leave the bathroom since it's locked and I have my pajamas on and it's really hot in there given the shower steam. I take my wolfhound and head to her house to make our next move. It's on our way out that we see blood on the stairs, droplets all the way down. We hurry outside and call 911. I'm on the phone with my mother this entire time, staying on the driveway in the snow because the puppy wouldn't leave the house. Police arrive and they rush my cousin away to the hospital. It turned out that he had stabbed himself several times and I was taken to my neighbor's house to wait for my parents. They arrive and they took me home where we all huddled together, not able to believe what had just happened. So yeah, my once adopted sibling, let's never meet again. So one day I'm chilling on Facebook and I get a friend request from a guy named Andy. At first I don't really think anything of it. I never add people I don't know anyway, so I ignore it for a few days. And then I get a notification about the notification saying that I still had a friend request for waiting. So I look at the guy's profile and I see that he has the same last name as my friend Rick's sister-in-law. So I asked Rick if he was family and he said that it was his sister-in-law's cousin. I thought it was a little weird that he wanted to add me as a friend, but whatever, no big deal. I didn't want to offend my friend, so I added him. Huge mistake. <laughs> now I'm a huge Harry Potter fan. I remember posting on my Facebook page that I was going to be at the midnight release of the new movie and being super excited to go with all my friends. Well, fast forward to the night of the movie and I'm there with my best friends and I see this guy just staring at me. I think, huh, weird, but I was really excited about the movie so I didn't give him a second thought. Once we get into the theater, we sit down and I see the guy sit down right in front of us. So we watch the movie and this guy keeps turning around and looking at me. I started to get really annoyed because he's distracting me from the movie. So I whisper, what? 
as mean as I could with a what the fuck look on my face, and he turns around and leaves me alone for the rest of the movie. When the movie is over, my best friend and I are walking out of the theater talking about how amazing the movie was when I see the same guy standing by my car. When I walk up to my car, it hits me that I've seen this guy before. It's the guy I added on Facebook. So my automatic thought is, okay, well maybe he just wants to meet me because I'm Rick's friend. I slow my footsteps down a few feet from my car before we reach him. He didn't say anything at first, so my friend and I looked at each other like, what the fuck does this guy want? So I said, hi, do I know you? And he goes, not yet, I'm Andy. Then he steps forward and hands me an envelope. Okay, this is getting weird, I think. Then he seemed really excited and says, open your present. And I'm like, uh, no thanks, dude. And I try to hand the envelope back to him. But this fucker just walks away, leaving me with my hand sticking out in the air toward him holding this envelope I don't want. My friend starts awkwardly laughing and grabs the envelope out of my hand, saying, Ooh, someone has a crush on you. I'm just kind of like, spooked, standing there, because I don't know who the F this guy is. So my best friend opens the envelope and it's a five page letter about how he feels about me, how beautiful I am, that he loves reading my stuff on social media, etc. Plus a $50 gift card to Starbucks. My friend stops laughing when she looks over at me and sees that I do not find this funny at all. I text Rick asking him if this is some kind of joke he's playing on me. He assured me that he had no idea what I was talking about. I explain the situation and Rick tells me that he barely even talks to Andy because he's quote, a weird dude. Oh, now you tell me. So I go home and delete him off my Facebook, rip up the weird five page note and give the gift card to my friend. In my mind, since I couldn't give the gift back and I wouldn't use it, I wouldn't feel like I owed him anything. Things started escalating pretty quickly once I graduated high school and was getting ready to move. See, I lived in a small town and I was getting ready to move to California to live with my dad. Once I moved, I started to get texts and phone calls from an unknown number. I finally answer the phone one day and the person tells me, oh hey, it's Andy, I miss you so much. And my heart feels frozen. It was so scary because I had no idea how he got my number. I politely ask him to leave me alone and hang up before he can say anything else. I quickly go to change my phone number, thinking, all right, this will stop him. But things actually got a lot worse. I started to get packages in the mail, things like a Harry Potter beanie, a Doctor Who jacket, and flowers. I got flowers from him almost every week, delivered to my door. I got a letter that asked if I would go to Italy with him, that he would pay for everything, no strings attached. And then the cherry on top was he fucking went to New York saw Daniel Radcliffe's play and got his autograph and picture with him and sent it to me. I threw out the picture of them, but I kept the autograph. Then the phone call started again. Like, how the F did this guy get my number again? I finally picked up the phone one day and told him to stop sending me stuff. I told him I was throwing everything away, that I didn't want or need anything from him. I told him he made me extremely uncomfortable. He didn't like that very much. And he basically said, you're in a bad mood today, and quickly hung up. The next time he called, I told him that I would in fact call the police if he kept calling. Things settled down a little bit. A few months went by, but then I got together with my now husband who lives in that little town. Of course, I moved back. I remember the first time I saw Andy when I got back. It was at a shopping center. He looked over at me, froze for a second, and then quickly started walking toward me. I felt the hairs on my arm stand up, and I turned around and quickly left the store without looking behind me. While all of this is going on, I reconnect with my sister, who, due to some family drama I hadn't talked to in about three years, it turns out she was the one who had told Andy my phone numbers. I always kept her updated on my address or phone number in case of an emergency, and she was also the one who gave him my address. I was almost mad enough to stop talking to her again, but she told me that he would message her on Facebook that he was my boyfriend and lost my number and wanted to send me a surprise. 
he also asked her if she would be okay with him asking to marry me. With us not talking, she had no idea that any of this wasn't true. Apparently, he can be a pretty charming liar. Anyways, she promises to not give him any more information about me and blocks him on Facebook as well. So at this point in my life, I'm with my now husband, then boyfriend, duh, and we have plans to get married soon. We are very excited and we tie the knot at the courthouse. Fast forward like a week after being married, my husband gets a Facebook message from Andy. It was basically asking him if he would be willing to share me. He offered to take both of us to dinner to discuss the situation. My husband was all for going for a free meal and then beating the shit out of this guy, but I didn't even want to look at him, let alone let my new husband go to jail over this. So we ignored it. The big blow up and how this story ends, for now and hopefully forever, is that he found out where I work. He came in one day and I had no choice but to help him. And then he started to fucking take pictures of me with his phone in front of customers and my coworker. I lost my shit on this guy. I started screaming at him to leave me alone then if he ever came near me or contacted me again or my husband, I would have him arrested. I honestly can't even remember what all I said. I was so mad. I was shaking and almost started crying. Luckily, my boss was really cool about the whole thing and I didn't even get in trouble for swearing in front of customers. Anyways, his face was priceless, totally shocked. He just slowly put his phone in his pocket and left. That was the last interaction I've had with him. It's been years and sometimes I still see him walking by my work, but he'll just quickly look in at me and then keep walking. As for why I never actually went to the cops, I was young and dumb and thought I could handle it, which I did, but I realized that I'm very lucky. If it had gotten worse, I definitely would have gone to the police. I'm not sure why he acted like this toward me or what I did to cause this to happen. Maybe he's just mentally unstable. Probably. Either way, I'm always on alert because of this guy. So Andy, let's never meet again. This is an experience that happened to me two summers ago while I was cat sitting slash house sitting for an older couple that I had met in a French class I was taking. This couple lived near a busy corner with a bookshop, coffee shop, a grocery store, and a movie theater in a nice neighborhood of a big city. For all of these reasons and more, I was pretty excited to house sit there. My own apartment, where I lived with my boyfriend and my own cat, was about a 10 minute drive or a 40 minute walk further up the street in a quiet residential area with nothing much around it. Now my own cat is vocal and super social. Because of this, we try never to leave him alone at night because he will literally cry for us all night long, and we're always slightly paranoid that he's going to get us evicted due to noise complaints from neighbors. We lived on the top floor, and you could literally hear him crying from the bottom floor and outside if the door to the building was open. So my boyfriend and I decided that he should stay at the apartment with our cat while I was house-sitting. Plus, my boyfriend works from home, so I was kind of excited to have some me time for a few days. My boyfriend drops me off at the house and I settle in with my luggage. I look around the surprisingly large three-story house and then decide to walk over to the grocery store to pick up some food for the next few days. As I'm walking home with my bag of groceries, I notice this man, extremely tall and gaunt, with a head full of long, shaggy hair, walking parallel across the street, watching me. I'm only about two houses away from the place where I'm staying, so I sit down on the edge of the wall as though taking a break, and I call my mom, trying to keep an eye on him surreptitiously from the corner of my eye. This man stops behind a pole across the street and continues to watch me. I tell my mom this guy seems to think that a pole hides him from my view, but that I can see him there, standing as still as a statue, just watching me. I don't want him to know where I'm staying, so we continue chatting, and eventually I turn my full gaze on the man to let him know that I see him watching me. For a moment, he doesn't react at all, and then he just sort of meanders on down the small street and I watch him turn the corner and disappear from my view. 
I tell my mom and gather my groceries and walk cautiously down the street, keeping an eye out for him as I near the place that I'm house sitting and I don't see him. I dart in through the back door next to the garage as quickly as I can and breathe a sigh of relief once I'm inside. I tell my mom that everything is good and I put away the groceries and forget about the entire incident. The couple has a beautiful library, so I contentedly spent the rest of the afternoon and well into the evening just perusing their wall of books and selecting a few to bring upstairs to the guest room on the third floor. I'm playing the Dario Marianelli PNP soundtrack and just enjoying the quiet downtime all to myself. I finally get sleepy, I text my boyfriend goodnight, and I fall asleep. I wake up shortly thereafter, after a terrifyingly realistic dream that this gaunt man has walked into the room, and trailing his fingertips across my body. The room is dark, dark, dark. All the window blinds shut, and my body goes completely still, half positive that it wasn't a dream, and that he had somehow broken in and was waiting in the shadow. I quietly reach underneath my pillowcase for my phone. I always keep my phone tucked under my pillow and it's not there. My panic rises and my mind overreacts. He's here and he's playing a game with me. He took my phone, he's somewhere in the house. I desperately begin to pat around my bed as quietly as possible, searching beneath the other pillow for my phone. Not there. I think surely he'll hear me if I get out of bed. But I suddenly remember that I left my laptop next to me on the bed and I opened it, quickly sending a text and another text, and another text to my boyfriend through iMessage until he wakes up. I tell him that I can't find my phone, that I had a bad dream, and that I'm super anxious. With him awake and responding, I get the courage to flip on the lamp and get out of bed. I search around the floor, thinking my phone must have fallen while I was sleeping. Nope, not on the floor. Finally, as I search the bed frantically, I find it atop the covers on the other side of the bed. Weird, but I suppose I must have knocked it across the bed or something. I don't sleep well the rest of the night, hearing noises from across the three floors of the creaky stairs and house, thinking that anyone could break in through the patio door across from my room. All they'd have to do is get to the balcony. And I wake up the next morning completely exhausted. The next day, I'm sitting in the living room at their piano practicing. I'm an opera singer, and I was mostly excited about the house sitting because I'd get the chance to sing without worrying about my apartment neighbors complaining, which they do. With the blinds open, I'm sitting there practicing away, enjoying the day. There are some kids riding their bikes, neighbors with dogs, the usual. I'm enjoying my afternoon when I notice that there's an odd, run-down, dilapidated dark house, nearly diagonal to this one, which doesn't fit in at all with the otherwise nice neighborhood. Gaunt Man walks out of it and sits on the porch. My stomach drops. I call my boyfriend and tell him that the creepy guy apparently lives across the street. I shut the blinds facing that way so that he couldn't see me, and I retreated to the other side of the house with the kitchen. I spend the rest of the day chilling, convincing myself that I'm overreacting, that everything is fine, and that I don't need to worry. Nonetheless, come nightfall, the house seems just way too large with too many entrances and the bottom floor is so far away that I worry the noise wouldn't carry up to the top floor if someone did break in. Naturally, I cannot sleep at all. I end up retrieving a knife from the kitchen and stashing it under the pillow. Noises keep me up, creaks keep me up, odd sounds keep me up. Around 11 o'clock, I call my boyfriend and basically beg him to come and stay with me, assuring him that our cat can survive one night without us. He drives over and pulls into the garage. I come and unlock the hall door from the garage to let him inside. I still don't sleep well, but at least I get some sleep with him there, feeling a little safer. He got a little wigged out about the knife under the pillow and told me to put it back where I found it. I stashed it in the bedside drawer, just in case. Not where I found it, but... Okay. The next day, I pull it together and tell him that he doesn't need to stay, that I'm clearly overreacting. Then comes nightfall, and the plethora of odd noises. I decide that I can't stay in the guest room at the top floor anymore because I feel like I can't hear anything. I go down to the second floor and try to sleep on the couch in their media room. George of the Jungle is on TV, and I try to fall asleep while watching that. 
Instead, I get more and more paranoid that I won't be able to hear anything over the movie, so I end up switching it off. I try to fall asleep again. Now I'm sure that I can hear noises from both above and below me, not the cat, who every night hid in a tote bag in their bedroom on the second floor and never made a sound except to hiss at me when we crossed each other's paths. I get no sleep, patrolling the entire house all night, finally falling asleep as the night sky tinged gray with dawn. The next day was my birthday, and his little sister was flying up from across the country to spend a week with us. He couldn't stay the night with me anymore because she was still quite young and needed adult supervision, and I insisted that she stay at our place rather than have them come to the house I was at. Fortunately, my best friend had just returned from her trip, and we decided to have a birthday sleepover. I feel a little paranoid, but again, I'm able to get some sleep with someone else there, and I wake up slightly more refreshed. She leaves, and I sit in the kitchen, which faces the street where the Gaunt Man first saw me. Gaunt Man is across the street, walking and watching. I duck down against the wall below the window, placing my phone at the gap between the blinds, with only the top of my head showing. Gaunt Man gets closer, still watching as I hit record on the video. I get several seconds of him watching the house until he suddenly seems to notice the top of my head or the phone and snaps his own gaze back to the sidewalk below him and walks on. My heart is pounding. Now he knows that I've watched him watching me again, and probably saw the phone recording or me taking a photo, and he lives right across the street, where he often sat on his porch for hours smoking with a couple of other men facing directly toward me. The next few nights were a blur of me wandering around the house, checking closets and other closed spaces upon returning from going out, placing chairs against entrances so that I'd hear them scrape if they were moved, half sleeping in the media room and double checking windows, exhausted until the couple of hours sleep I would get when the sky would tinge gray once more and I'd felt that I'd survived the most dangerous part of the night. My best friend found out that I wasn't sleeping at all and offered to stay with me for the last night. My boyfriend's little sister was still there, so he couldn't. I accepted her offer, feeling foolish and overdramatic, but thankful nonetheless. We stayed back up in the guest room on the top floor, watching Parks and Recreation quietly with the subtitles on so that I could still hear the rest of the house. It was around 1 a.m., so when a shrill, piercing siren suddenly echoed throughout the house, my best friend and I sat up in bed, paralyzed with fear and confusion. Did they say anything about an alarm? She asked me. No, I responded hesitantly, wondering if I had missed something in the notes that they had left. We stared at each other for a long moment. What should we do? She said. I don't know, I said. Should we shut the door? Should we shut it and lock it? We should shut it and lock it, right? She was closest to the door, so she shut it quickly and locked it. I moved the nightstand in front of it, a pathetic barricade. The siren continued to wail throughout the house. Should we call the police? I asked, my heart pounding and in my mouth at this point, opening the blinds with my hands and trying to peer through the dark street below. There was a window to the bathroom with access from the balcony patio. I checked it just to make sure yet again that it was shut and locked. We, we, we should probably call the police, or, or should we? She had already begun to call the police, telling them that we were house-sitting and that an alarm had just gone off. We were concerned about a man who had been watching me over the past few days, and we were alone in the house. The police got our address and said they would arrive soon, and suddenly the alarm stopped. With the alarm off, we gathered the courage to remove the nightstand from the door and unlock it. I had pepper spray gripped tightly in my hand as we swung the door open, ready to confront whatever was out there. Nothing. No one. I checked the giant glass door a few steps away that led to the balcony patio. It was locked. We made our way down the stairs, cautious and quiet. We finally made it down to the bottom floor when there was a pounding at the front door. I hurriedly made it over to the door, removing the chair that I had placed in front of it as quickly as I could, letting in two policemen. They had identified themselves through the door. They came inside and asked me a few questions about this man, and then decided it was probably just a harmless homeless man. I didn't tell them that he lived across the street, because one, I thought they would accuse me of overreacting. 
you know. He was just walking home, not following you. And two, if I was overreacting, I didn't want to send the police over to this poor man's house at 2 a.m. and cause him trouble. They couldn't find a security system and told us that it was the fire alarm that had gone off but that they couldn't figure out why. After checking the house and finding no one, they left. I emailed the owners the next day to tell them what had happened and that we had to call the police to come check it out. They apologized that it had happened and thought that it was strange. I left the next day and politely declined house-sitting for them when they asked again a few months later. We moved out of the city and across the country last summer, and my boyfriend only recently told me that he and my dad, who had come to help us move, had seen Gaunt Man walking across the street from our apartment in that last week before we moved. So Gaunt Man, even if you weren't stalking and watching me, let's never meet again. I got married right at 18. I was a pretty book smart kid, but I lacked street smarts. By the time I turned 20, my now ex-husband and I had moved into a rental property in a pretty nice suburb outside Chicago. In the basement of the house was a big mother-in-law suite where a good male friend of ours named Nick lived as well. I was about halfway through nursing school at this time. This particular semester of nursing school, I had a very early clinical rotation once a week. I was 21 at the time. I am not a morning person, so in order to maximize the amount of time I spent asleep, I started loading all my stuff into the car the night before. Bags, books, even my purse. Again, I lack street smarts. One particular night before clinicals, I asked my ex-husband Bobby to get a book from my car. Bob does, but forgets to lock the door. The next morning when I go to my car, I note that my purse is gone. I ended up filing a police report. I was most concerned because I had just gotten this new job as a nurse's aide at the hospital and I had my social security card still sitting in my wallet. Strike three for street smarts. Almost immediately after the theft, strange things began to happen. We started getting ding-dong ditches at all hours of the night, which if you're not familiar just means someone rings your doorbell and runs. Someone vandalized mine, Nick's, and Bob's car with strange graffiti like hangmen and Nazi swastikas. Our house got egged. Nick's tires were slashed. At first, we chalked it up to neighborhood pranksters, but when we started having damages that cost some decent money, we called the police. Not to mention, one day when Bob was mowing the lawn, he noticed a pile of cigarette butts outside the bedroom window. The police came out, pretty much did nothing but take a report, and told us to perhaps invest in car alarms and some brighter floodlights for the driveway. A few weeks after this, at 2.30 in the morning, I get a call on my cell. It was the police in a neighboring town. They had picked up someone who had my ID on him, someone named Craig J. When they asked why he had someone else's ID on him, he claimed that I was his girlfriend. The cop had called me because my name had popped up that I had filed a police report for theft. I assured the cops that I had never heard of him before and was told that I could pick up my ID at the police station within the next few days. At that point, things really started to escalate, but I still didn't make the connection that perhaps these incidents were related. I started getting strange messages on MySpace, this was in 2009, as well as on Facebook from a clearly fake account, many of them actually, with long-winded messages that made no sense. This person started messaging friends of mine as well. I deleted MySpace and blocked the person on Facebook, but new accounts kept getting created. Somehow, this person got my email address and started sending emails as well. I had no idea who this person could be, but they seemed to know details about me that indicated that this was either someone I knew or someone who knew someone that I knew. The messages weren't overly threatening, just creepy enough to where I started to become pretty uncomfortable. One night, my friend Lauren and I were sitting on the couch watching TV. Bob, Lauren's husband, and a few other friends had gone out for the night. As we're sitting around chilling, we hear something that sounds like someone shaking the garage door. It was an attached garage. I go and check the garage, but nothing seems out of the ordinary. 
We had occasional issues with raccoons, so I chalked it up to that, but the noise kept coming. Lauren and I started to get freaked out at this point. Now understand the layout of the house. It was a modern style ranch house with no upstairs. The garage sounds moved now to the kitchen window, a distinct sound of someone knocking or scratching hard on the windows came. We call our husbands, who did not answer. At this point, we debated calling the police. I mean, what if it was just an animal or tree branches? We didn't want to seem stupid. As we debate, I see Lauren's face go sheet white and look past me. I spin around and I can see the fortunately locked handle to the front door wiggling. We were seated near the kitchen. We jump up and Lauren grabs a knife from the butcher block on the counter and I grabbed a small hammer from the junk drawer. We book it to the back of the house where the bedrooms are, cell phone in hand, and lock ourselves in one of the bedrooms and call the police. The dispatcher tells us to stay on the line, move furniture in front of the door if possible, and that the police were on their way. We shoved a dresser in front of the door, knife and hammer in hand. We agreed that if this fucker was going to come in, he might be bigger or stronger than us, but he was not going down without a fight. We planned that if he got here and in before the cops did, I would go for the head with the hammer and she would go for the gut with the knife. Cops show up, banging on the front door, shouting, police, open up. We can see the red and blue lights through the window. We leave the room, let the cops in, and they find no signs of anyone present or any evidence that anyone had tried to break in. They took a report, and in the meantime, our husbands finally called us back. They came home and the cops left. Flash forward a few months, a very close friend of ours, Sean, was renovating his apartment and needed a place to crash along with his girlfriend. Bob and I decided he could stay in the third bedroom in our house since nobody used it. The first night that Sean stayed with us, we were awoken at two o'clock in the morning by Sean screaming at someone at the top of his lungs. Bob and I jump out of bed and rush into the hall and into Sean's room. Sean and his girl are wide awake, lights on, looking totally freaked out. The screen is sliced and flopping in the wind. Sean told us he woke up to someone using what he thought was a knife on the screen and this person had started climbing in through the window. We called the cops again. They came out again and took another statement. Sean describes the guy as best he could. A white male, young looking, semi-shaved head with what looked like darker hair. Cops dust for fingerprints, come back as a match for Craig J. Turns out I knew who he was, vaguely. He was a year younger than me and we had gone to the same high school, but I couldn't remember having any significant interactions with him. He lived with his parents only a few blocks from my parents' house. I ended up reaching out to high school acquaintances who knew him, and they remembered him as a nice but odd kid. Kind of quiet, but definitely on the strange side, who had dropped out of school before graduation. Upon realizing that Sean had just moved in, the cop makes a statement that chilled all of us. He probably didn't realize anyone was staying in this bedroom and thought the room would be empty. Cops go there and arrest him. He suddenly has quite the story for them. That he and I were secret lovers and I was ignoring him. We had a relationship, you see. He also had, quote, been allowed into my home, quote, many times. Well, I was, quote, floored. He gets charged with something like trespassing or breaking and entering and does a light time for it, maybe a month, and has to pay a fine. In the meantime, I get a restraining order on him. He gets out and I hear nothing from him. And I also develop a completely irrational fear of first floor windows. Around Christmas of 2010, I'm now 23, I figure that the whole Craig thing is in the past. Bob and I decided to divorce, which was unrelated to this, and to go our separate ways, and Nick had long since moved out. We ended the lease, and I moved to a less desirable suburb, but with more affordable rent. I settled on an apartment in a four unit building that had a locked entrance, and the only way in was with a key or with someone opening the door from the inside. I lived on the second floor. By this time I had graduated and was now a nurse and was working now at a nursing home. Around spring or summer of 2011, it started up again, with calls coming through to me at work, only to have somebody hang up. 
Letters suddenly appeared in the staff-only mailbox, mailed to me with no return address. The strange email started up again from random accounts. The messages were never overly threatening, but they were long, way too frequent, way too out there. He spoke to me as if we were long-lost friends and had some sort of connection. I don't think he ever threatened to hurt me, although the cutting into the house with the knife thing... I don't know what was going through his mind if it wasn't to hurt me. What I kind of seemed to piece together over the years from all his rambling is that he had some sort of crush on me when I was younger, although I never remember even speaking to him during high school. And him happening to rob my car was some sort of sign from the universe or something that we were meant to be together. I called the cops and they basically tell me that because there haven't been any threats and other than an order of protection or a cease and desist, there's not much they can do except watch and wait. Great. This goes on for a while and finally one night I wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning to the doorbell ringing. I'm instantly in a panic. I look out the window and there illuminated in the floodlight is Craig. I burst out crying. In my half-awake state, I run across the hall and start banging on my neighbor's door. He was an older divorced guy who lived alone. He goes downstairs and confronts Craig and tells him the cops have been called. And I actually call the cops and he takes off. I file a report and they claim that they'll talk to him. But this only makes things worse. Friends I have on Facebook now start getting random messages from Craig asking about me, telling them that he has important information for me. Other times, he alternates, saying that I owe him money and that I have a debt I need to pay off. My friends block him as he goes along, making new accounts. Meanwhile, my younger sister is living in the city with a few friends. He somehow finds out where she lives and drives to her apartment and confronts her while she has people over. She freaks out and they kick him out. She calls the cops, who basically again state that he didn't commit a crime, but they offer her a restraining order. Right after this, another incident occurs. My younger cousin is a high school senior on the cross-country team. He shows up at my cousin's practice. My cousin has no clue who he is. He starts demanding information about me. The coach gets involved. Craig gets into a fight with the coach. The cops are called. He's banned from the school grounds, but that's it. He calls the nursing home administrator at my job, asking him to talk to me and that he has important information to tell me. The administrator, who was now well aware of the situation, told him not to come onto the property or he would have to arrest him for trespassing. At this point, I'm paranoid beyond measure. Then, just as quickly as it started, it faded off. It's now the summer of 2012, and the final chapter in this saga begins. I'm almost 25 now. A friend of mine named Stacy, and incidentally, Sean's ex, moved in with me temporarily while she looked for a place. She was dating a new guy and spent quite a few nights at his place. One day, I picked up a double shift, starting at 7 a.m. and ending at 11.30 p.m. Stacy texts me around 3.30 in the afternoon, stating that she won't be home that night and was going out with her new guy. So I arrive home almost at midnight. The first thing I notice is that the door is unlocked. Uneasy, but thinking perhaps Stacy had just forgotten to lock it, I casually peer inside. I pan my gaze to the kitchen and living room. I can't shake the feeling that I'm unsettled. Something wasn't sitting right. Due to all of these incidents, I always made sure that one or two lights were on, even when we weren't home. I was still not even fully in the door when I noticed that I was staring into a pitch black apartment. And immediately my brain went into full panic, and I'm glad it did. Realistically, Stacy could have forgotten to leave a light on, but my instincts were in overdrive, sounding off five alarm fire alarm bells. My Puerto Rican neighbor who lived in one of the building's units was known for his weekend parties and I could hear a party going on downstairs. I booked it downstairs and bust into the party and told him what happened. He looks at me like I'm crazy, but he agrees to come upstairs with me anyway. We get inside, he looks around and we don't see anybody and I'm starting to wonder if maybe I'm just nuts. 
Maybe Stacy had her boyfriend over and they left in a hurry, forgetting to turn on the low lights and lock the door. He agrees with me and sort of jokingly pulls open the pantry door. What I saw next will never, ever leave my mind. There, crouched inside my pantry, is Craig. The Puerto Rican neighbor puts the guy in a chokehold. I call the police. To this day, I have no idea what he planned on doing. Cops come out and he's finally, finally arrested. Because my neighbor was having a party, he had the door open to the alleyway. Chances are he just walked into the building, and if anyone even noticed, people would just assume he was there for the party or whatever. It's more confusing how he got into the apartment itself. My theory is that my roommate at the time was from the country. While I lived in a suburb, it was the type of suburb right on the edge of a major US city, so we always locked our doors and generally kept everything secured as a rule, but she was used to leaving her doors unlocked and wide open. And I think, honestly, it may have just slipped her mind when she went out the door for the night. I confronted her about it, and of course she denied it, but that's really the only logical way that he could have gotten in. I always locked both the knob lock and the deadbolt whenever I left the house. Unless he was some kind of skilled locksmith, I have no idea how he could have gotten in. I didn't stay alone or go anywhere by myself for a long time after that. I feel that I actually developed a paranoia because of all of this, and I was highly suspicious of giving my number or any information to anyone. He ended up being charged and convicted of aggravated stalking, breaking and entering, and some other charges. I did meet his parents in court, who were both shockingly very normal, apologetic people. They tried explaining their son. They claimed that he was mentally ill and suffered from bipolar disorder. They said, when he's medicated, he's okay, but when he's off his meds, he's nuts. After he served time, I did not hear from him for years until 2016 when he found me on Facebook. I was much older now, around 29. I replied to him very firmly that any contact would end in the police being called and that I had no interest in him at all. I blocked him in any way that I could. Recently he found my new husband on Facebook and friended him. He blocked him as well. To this day I still have a paranoia. I had parked my car near a baseball diamond once and some kid most likely hit a baseball into my windshield and took off because I had a perfectly baseball sized spider crack on the glass. Despite it being completely logical that it was almost certainly a ball, I instantly reverted to, oh god, is he back? I have no idea what happened to him. I also am now a total psycho about keeping things locked, and twice my life got screwed up because doors weren't locked my car door and most likely my apartment door. I have an acquaintance monitor him on Facebook. His page is not private and from what I've seen he appears to go through periods where he's pretty inactive and then episodes where he's rambling, over posting, over sharing and acting generally deranged. I believe his parents were telling the truth when they said that he's okay when he's medicated and part of me feels bad for him. I'm older now. I've been a nurse for almost a decade. Some of which I spent at a psych specialty unit. The mind is a hell of a thing. Looking back though, those were some of the worst years of my adult life. He put me through a lot of anxiety and caused a lot of issues for me. I slept with my couch pushed against my apartment door for the next two years before I moved out of there. I'm now married, but on nights where I'm home alone, I still find myself resisting the urge to stack furniture in front of the doors. One of the other fallouts from this situation is that Craig either sold, lost, or gave away my social security card that had been in my purse. Someone tried to file for Medicaid benefits in Arizona using my name and social, as well as obtained a job using my social and failed to pay any taxes, leaving me with a surprise asset freeze by the IRS and a whole financial mess that had to be untangled before they would unfreeze my accounts and pay me the money they started to pull out for back taxes that I had nothing to do with. My credit got extremely messed up for years because of it, and to this day I have a lock on my social security number and monitor my accounts like a hawk. Moral of the story, never leave your purse in the car and always lock your doors. And Craig, I hope we never, ever meet again. This happened about six years ago. I was about 12, 
and my brother was 26 at the time. My brother had been serving in the U.S. Army for several years, and when this happened, he was deploying to the Middle East on his second deployment. Also of note is that he was Green Beret and had recently, in the last three or four months prior to this trip, completed the Army Special Forces Qualification Course, Robin Sage and all that. By then, he was an active duty Special Forces Engineer Sergeant, definitely not someone you'd want to fuck around with. Given that we both grew up with a passion for the outdoors, he thought it would be nice to take me on a backpacking trip in northern Alabama before he was going to be gone for nine months. The trip had gone smoothly, right up until the third night that we were camping out. At about 8 p.m., we had our camp set up. We'd eaten dinner and we were sitting by the fire just talking about typical boy shit, guns, girls, etc. For some reference, our spot was about 50 yards from a large stream and about 50 yards downhill adjacent to the large path. Our camp, the stream, and the path formed a triangle of sorts. This was summertime in Alabama, so it wasn't quite dark yet when two guys who looked to be in their late 20s wandered up and asked if we had seen any hogs while we were hiking around. Now given that this was rural Alabama, we actually had seen some farther into the wilderness area and we told them so. Even though they were relatively polite, my brother called them good old boys. I got a seriously creepy vibe from them. Dirty clothes, greasy hair, scraggly facial hair, etc. I think they probably looked like they belonged in the movie Deliverance. They kind of hung out for a few minutes, maybe a little longer than they should have done, looking around and asking us questions like how long we'd been out there, how long we were staying, and what looked like them kind of sizing us up. Then they abruptly said goodbye and walked away. I didn't necessarily feel threatened by them, and I know for sure my brother didn't, but I still felt uneasy about the whole thing. Fast forward three or four hours. My brother and I had gone to sleep and were nestled in our tent when I woke to the sound of multiple dogs barking. I've always been a heavy sleeper, and they sounded like they were only about a hundred yards away. My heart immediately started pounding and I kicked my brother through my sleeping bag and asked if he was awake and had he heard the dogs. He responded, I'm awake. They've been getting closer for the past hour or so. Just lay still and don't make any sounds. Needless to say, 12 year old me was about to shit my pants. We would also hear sporadic shouts from several different sources, but neither came any closer. A few minutes later, my brother whispered, they're just hunting for hogs. They use the dogs to pin them down and then they shoot them. This gave me some relief, but not much. Somehow I managed to fall back asleep. The fact that they were doing this at night was a huge red flag my brother later told me, but I think he was just trying to keep me calm. Fast forward to what was probably another three hours later, around 2 a.m. I had managed to sleep pretty well after first hearing the hog hunters when I woke up to my brother squeezing my shoulder firmly, saying, wake up, put your shoes on quick and follow me. Be as quiet as you can. My heart immediately went back to racing because I heard the dogs and the voices in the distance, farther away than before, but still distinct. I knew better than to ask questions. I did what he said, and as soon as we were out of the tent, he told me to get on his back. This was a breeze for him after rucking with God knows how much weight in the army. We snuck about 50 yards into the woods toward the junction of the path and the stream and crawled into some bushes. It was up a hill, so we had a pretty good elevated view of our campsite. I remember as we were laying there how loudly I was breathing and how quiet he was when I heard the very distinct sound of a pistol slide racking. I looked over and my brother had his pistol and was watching the campsite and surrounding area. I started to whisper to him when he put his hand over my mouth and pointed at the campsite. The group of hunters had been steadily approaching our camp, and by this time had reached it. There were five of them and like three or four dogs. They all looked relatively young, but two had either rifles or shotguns, and the dogs were going crazy, obviously having smelled our scent. 
For those of you who are backpackers or campers, nobody who comes up on a random camp in the middle of the night with dogs and guns has good intentions. I knew this, my brother knew this, and I was scared shitless. I couldn't make out what they were saying, but my brother later told me that they were talking about us, although he hadn't heard any specifics. They lingered for about 20 minutes, shining flashlights around and talking to themselves. When my brother put his mouth to my ear, he said, if they come towards us, I want you to turn and run as fast as you can. Don't stop, don't look back, stay off the trail and look for the flashing lights. I didn't know what he meant by this, but that'll come later. I knew I could make it back because he had taught me land navigation pretty well. He then handed me a flashlight and told me not to take the red filter off. He told me later that the red filter helps preserve night vision and cuts down ambient light so that it would be harder for someone to see me from a distance, but at this point I was so scared that I almost started crying, but at the same time I had a rush of adrenaline and what I think now was confidence that he had taught me that I could handle myself. We laid there for a while longer. Then, out of nowhere, they all started screaming, Where are y'all at? And firing into the woods at random. My brother dragged me back behind the crest of the hill and threw himself on top of me. Thankfully, our position on top of the hill was protected from any gunfire. They shot maybe five or six more times and then started walking back the direction they had come from. They got maybe a hundred yards away when I heard a blaring siren and saw emergency lights flashing through the woods. Turns out my brother had called the Forest Service office on a satellite phone my family has for emergencies while I was asleep, and they had sent out Forest Service officers and game wardens to our area of the wilderness. The Sipsi Wilderness is about 25,000 acres in size, so it took them a while to get there on the dirt roads. When we saw the game warden truck, my brother signaled them with the light and pointed them in the direction the hunters had gone, and the guy sped off, shining his spotlight through the woods. As soon as they were all gone, we went back to our camp, packed up our shit, and waited by the path for the game warden to come back, who then gave us a ride in his truck bed back to the main staging area. On the drive back, my brother told me how brave I'd been, and that we would talk about it with our parents the next day if I wanted to. I asked him not to do that because I thought they might never let me go camping again. So creepy rednecks in the woods, let's not meet again, because you might get shot next time. Hello lovely listeners and welcome back. This concludes part two of this epic let's not meet extravaganza. I actually thought that there were only two parts, but it turns out, as I mentioned in the community post, that there are three parts. Um, I had recorded 36 stories, and a lot of them were pretty long. Um, and in Premiere Pro, which is the editing software that I use, you have um, these things called sequences, which are basically like tabs in a browser. And I had recorded certain, like a when I realized I needed to break them up because that entire thing wouldn't uh, export in a reasonable amount of time, if at all. I had broken them up into sequences and I thought I only had two. And then I went through and I was like, wait, that doesn't seem like enough stories. Like I did more than that. So I looked and I was like, oh no, there were actually three. <laughs> so I just like got carried away, guys. I don't know what happened. I just started recording them and kept going down my spreadsheet. And then I was like, how many do I have? <laughs> but um, I probably could have just kept some so there weren't three let's not meet videos in a row. But I don't think anyone's complaining. Everybody seems to like them. So that's fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, anyway, we'll probably do another premiere tomorrow. Like I mentioned, um, I may retitle it instead of part three, just cause it might look weird to people who weren't like around when this whole thing was going on. Um, I might just put like a different title. I think I have like six left or something. So I'll probably just call it like six epic let's not meet stories or something. Cause they're all long. So yeah, anyway, but we'll have a premiere tomorrow night to do that. And then Dracula is coming up, which I will have to edit and release in 
in, in parts, <laughs> probably a few chapters at a time, because obviously that's like a six and a half hour, six hour book, uh, which I'm not sitting around for that export if it even works. <laughs> so um, that will, those will all come consecutively, but probably like a day or so apart. Um, I have them broken up into sections and then I'm just going to edit and release them as they come about. So I can't go as crazy with the sound effects and stuff on the longer ones because all of that adds to the export time and is more for the computer to handle. So it'll probably just be like rain sounds or something in the background and then like squeaky doors and stuff like that when they come up so but that has been a lot of fun to do um i'll have a couple of polls this week one will be regarding the next classic novel you want me to read um on the channel and then the next the poll after that will be whether or not you guys want to hear my let's not meet and paranormal stories because i have enough to fill a video for each <laughs> so if you want to hear those i would be happy to tell them so um i will post those i hope i don't like drive you guys crazy with the community tab but i'm just like so excited i have an art channel for those of you who don't know i'll put the link somewhere um if you want to go check it out but um i have been dying for a community tab on that for like three years <laughs> because it's so difficult to update people on youtube without it so now when i when i got the community tab for this um, channel. I just sort of like went wild with it. <laughs> it's so nice to just be able to jump on and update people. So anyway, enough babbling. Um, I just wanted to let you guys know what was happening with this three-part nonsense that's been going on. Um, and also if you hear any like thumping or like music in the background of some of these recordings, we had a neighbor who was having a party and I was like not about to wait until that was over with to record. So Eh, it might be there, but hopefully the sound reduction, <laughs> noise reduction filter took care of most of it. So anyway, I hope you guys are all doing well and I hope you enjoyed these stories and I will be back with some paranormal stuff after this because I have a lot of it in the wings um, and some creepy pastas and original stuff too. So I will see you guys in the next one. Bye for now. Ooh.